Good morning, church. I want to welcome you to Twin Rivers this morning once again. What a blessing to be together, to celebrate the fact that our, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ is not in the grave. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. As we continue our worship this morning, can we prepare our hearts to celebrate as we continue to do so in prayer? Uh, Father, our hearts are full of joy. We rejoice that Jesus, our Savior, isn't dead. He's alive. He's risen. He rules and he reigns forevermore. Father, as we gather together in this place, as we an opportunity to fellowship, even around the table of breakfast this morning, as we've had opportunity, Lord, to lift up praises to your name in worship, we continue our worship in your word. On this Resurrection Sunday, we pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts to hear it, to receive it, that you would remove anything that would get in the way in this moment. Allow us to give you our undivided attention. And so this morning, Father, we pray what we know not teach us, what we have not give us, and who we are not in Christ, we ask that you'd make us, and we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, this uh, past Monday, we had heard some reports that there was going to be some snow in the area. And in order to increase our chances that we were going to see it, uh, we decided, our family decided to drive up to McKinsey and drive up to Sahaley Falls. My wife decided to stay back, and so I got our two girls. We got a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and we popped them in the back seat. And uh, then I drove off. And as we drove, the, the higher in elevation we got, the more snow we began to see. And there was more snow on the ground. But the girls really didn't notice the snow until it was really coming down. And I made this announcement. I said, hey, girls, look outside and tell me what you see. So our girls are looking around. I knew they'd be excited, but my four-year-old, she surprised me a little bit. She's looking around, and she said, oh, my goodness, her face lights up. It's snowing outside. And then she says, Daddy, I've been praying that it would snow again. And look, Daddy, it's snowing <laughs> outside. You know, in that moment, I realized that uh, the reason we're experiencing some winter weather in springtime is partly because of her <laughs> as she's praying for more snow. <laughs> you know, on this Resurrection Sunday, I'm reminded of this fact. The reason why a four-year-old can get excited about answered prayer for snow is the same reason you and I can get excited about worship this morning. The Savior and Lord we worship and serve is not dead in the grave, but He is risen. He reigns and He rules forevermore. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. On this Resurrection Sunday, as we rejoice and worship together, I want to take some time to share with us the message of the Resurrection. You know, in the day and age that we live in, there's no doubt we need the message of the resurrection now more than ever. I tuned into the world news last night and was watching all the bad news going on in the world around us. I heard about that senseless shooting in South Carolina at a mall just yesterday. Unfortunately, senseless shootings are more prevalent in our day. And unfortunately, we feel less surprised by it when we see it. We continue to hear about what's going on in Ukraine as it relates to the, uh, the invasion of Russia. And I mean, as we are here today celebrating, eating breakfast and fellowshipping with one another uh, across the ocean, we know they there find themselves with bodies in the middle of the streets, people whose lives have been lost, people who have been displaced. There's so much hopelessness going on in the world, and the message of the resurrection is needed now more than ever. You take a look at our lives and we consider some of the hopeless difficulties we experience in our lives. Maybe you're facing some impossible circumstances. The message of the resurrection is needed now more than ever. And I want to invite you to the Gospel of John, chapter 21, as we're going to be reminded what the message of the resurrection is all about. And as you turn there in your Bibles, chapter 21 of the Gospel of John is the last chapter. We're going to read about... Another appearance that Jesus makes as the resurrected Savior and Lord. Jesus, early Sunday morning, after being in the grave three days, rises from the dead. Mary Magdalene and the other ladies, they come to the tomb. Jesus is not there. Mary goes and she tells Peter and the other disciple who loved Jesus, probably the apostle John. And they run and they go, and they go to 
they go to see it for themselves and they go in. And then Mary returns to the tomb later that day. If you remember, she's looking around and she sees what she thinks is a gardener. And the gardener tells, calls her by name and says, Mary. At that moment, she knows it's the risen Savior. She, she clings to him. And Jesus says, don't cling to me. Go and talk to my disciples. I must ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Well, after these things, Jesus appears to some of the disciples without Thomas and then appears to the disciples with Thomas Today we're going to read about another appearance that Jesus makes before his disciples in Galilee, on the Sea of Galilee, and we're going to consider this morning the message of the resurrection in light of it. So would you stand in honor of the reading of the word this Resurrection Sunday? We're going to be in the first 17 verses together. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And this way he showed himself, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for, the, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to them the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, You know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. The word of the Lord, you all may be seated in the presence of God on this glorious Resurrection Sunday together. What is the message of the resurrection? The message of the resurrection that we need to be reminded of more now than ever. What is the message of the resurrection? If those of you who may be here today, you may not be a believer, but a seeker, or maybe you're just invited. What is the, mes- the, the message of the resurrection that brings hope to the hopeless and forgiveness to those who need it in Christ Jesus? As we walk through our text together, the first thing we see is that the message of the resurrection is an invitation to believe in Jesus and experience life in his name. You know, in these first few verses, we are introduced to the very details that surround another appearance that Jesus makes before his disciples in Galilee. The first three verses introduce us to the setting of this appearance before these disciples that Jesus makes on the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee. But these verses flow out of the context of the final, of the last chapter, chapter 20, verse 31, where John tells us the reason why these things are recorded, the reason why these miracles are recorded. He writes in verse 31 of chapter 20, but these things are written so that you may believe 
Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. When he records these miracles, when he records these eyewitness accounts, the purpose for why they are recorded is in order for us to believe. We are invited to believe and to experience the life he offers us in his name. When you think of all the miracles that Jesus did, and he did many, they were amazing. He healed the sick. He made the lame walk again. He made the blind see. But the greatest miracle is the fact that Jesus was dead in the grave, but three days later rose in newness of life. And these who were witnesses to what Jesus has done proves the fact that the resurrection is indeed true. And what Christ did on the cross in paying the penalty for our sin was indeed acceptable before the Father as Jesus rose in newness of life. And so as we flow out of the context of chapter 20, verse 31, into this appearance and the details that surround it, we're introduced to the timing of the appearance. It says in verse 1, after these things. So Jesus has already appeared to his disciples. They found themselves hopeless. They found themselves sorrowful, not knowing. After all, they've been following this Jesus for three years. Now he's dead in the grave, but now he's already appeared to them. You remember, he appeared to them first without Thomas. And as he appeared to his disciples and they interacted with him after the appearance, they will go over to Thomas, if you recall, in John chapter 20. And they say, Thomas, Jesus isn't dead. He's, he's risen. He's alive. Remember what Thomas said? He's the skeptic. He's the doubter. He, he says, I won't believe it until I see it. Let me see his nail-pierced hands. Let me see his side. And then later, Jesus appears not just to the disciples without Thomas, but all the disciples with Thomas. And as Jesus comes to Thomas and he says, look at my scars on my hands and take a look at my side. Do you remember what Thomas says and declares his eyewitness account? He says, my Lord and my God. So the disciples have seen Jesus. He is not dead. He is risen. But they're in this state of awaiting him to meet them in Galilee. Because secondly, we don't just see the timing after these things, but we also see the place they're at. They're at the Sea of Tiberias. This is the Sea of Galilee. You and I are more familiar with that. The reason they're in Galilee, we know, in Matthew 28, verses 7 to 10, is because as Jesus instructed the women when, they, when, when Jesus appeared to them, he said, go and tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee. He has some further instructions to give them. And so they're hanging out in Galilee. They know that Jesus is risen. And it tells us exactly which disciples are going to be here at the appearance. Take a look at verse 2. It tells us, in verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And what an amazing thing that when Jesus had died on the cross, all of his disciples, at least John was present at the crucifixion, when Jesus turns to John and says, hey, this is your mother, you're going to take care of her. Woman, this is your son. At least he's there. But all the disciples have abandoned Jesus. Uh, Peter has denied Jesus. And Thomas, he is the doubter. And, and these disciples have been through a lot. Let me tell you what. And as Jesus is, is, is dead in the grave for three days, these disciples are fearful. Who comes to the grave early Sunday morning? It's not the, the disciples. It's the ladies, Mary Magdalene. The other women, they've come to see where Jesus is, and at least they're going to do something. They, they expect to at least embalm the body or, or put some, 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 something on him, but nevertheless, he's not there. But these disciples, just like Jesus, have been through a lot. How many of you know Jesus had been through a lot his final week of his life? We started last week, and last Sunday, we talked about his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and it was a tough week, a long Week, but it's also been a long week for these disciples. These disciples have been following Jesus for three years. They've been following Jesus and they truly believe that he is the Messiah, the one who is going to rule and reign over the Jews. They have somewhat of an expectation that perhaps he's going to set up his earthly kingdom, but all their hope and all their trust is in Jesus. They've given up their whole lives in order to follow this Jesus. And as he enters into Jerusalem, he is going to die, be crucified on a cross. This is not a private execution. 
This is a public execution. And these disciples, after Jesus dies on the cross and is placed in the grave, are shaking in fear, not knowing if the Jews, the leaders of the Jews, are going to do to them what they did to Jesus. But early Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, Jesus rose again from the dead, told Mary Magdalene and the others, and told these disciples. And Jesus gave these disciples hope where they once had hopelessness. Jesus provided joy where there was once sorrow. And Jesus has a way of bringing this diverse group of men together. They're from different places with different backgrounds. And here they are gathered together in Galilee. They don't know really what to do next as they're waiting for Jesus to see what he's going to do. And what we see is that the message of the resurrection is an invitation to believe in Jesus, the risen Savior. They believe in him. They're waiting for him. They're awaiting the next appearance and to experience life in his name, and they're about to experience the abundant life as sooner than later the Holy Spirit's going to come upon them and the church is going to be born. And then we read what they're doing while during this appearance as it's coming about. It tells us in verse 3, as they're waiting in Galilee, guess what Peter says? Hey guys, I'm going fishing. What do you do while you're waiting for Jesus to appear in Galilee? Peter says, I'm going fishing. He's kind of the leader in the group. He's the spokesperson. He's the guy who puts his foot in his mouth way too often. And yet God's going to transform his weakness into strength. (laughs) And he says, I'm going fishing. And the rest of the disciples say, we are going with you. And at the end of verse 3, it tells us they catch nothing. I mean, these are skilled fishermen. That's what they do for a living. And they go back to fishing after following Jesus for three years. And they catch nothing. Can I share this morning, in these just first few verses, we're reminded that the message of the resurrection is an invitation to believe in Jesus. Not just to believe anything about Jesus, but to believe that he is the risen Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And the invitation of the Gospel of John as we hear these eyewitness accounts about the resurrection that are verifiable and reliable is in order that you and I would believe. The strongest evidence that Jesus is who he claimed to be is the resurrection. We want to consider that this morning. If you believe in Jesus, may this account increase your belief and may you continue to believe. If you haven't yet trusted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, the invitation is to believe in him and to experience not just the life eternal that he offers, but the abundant life that he offers in his name. The message of the resurrection is an invitation to believe in Jesus and to experience life in his name. Secondly, the message of the resurrection is an invitation to come to Jesus and be with him. Okay, so they're out on the sea, they're fishing, and they're out there all night. This is customary, and they're not finding anything. Well, what motivates them to come to Jesus as he appears to them on the shore? First, we see they see Jesus But they don't recognize him. Verse 4 tells us that. It says, but when the morning had come. So they've been out all night. At this point, they're cold. They're tired. They're probably hungry. They're exhausted, a bit disappointed. I mean, you've been fishing all night and you haven't caught anything. These are, you know, these fishermen know what they're doing. That's what they do for a living. I mean, Simon, Peter, the sons of Zebedee, James, and John, they should know what they're doing. And it says, we are, uh, verse 4, But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Some people look at this and they ask, How do you not know it's Jesus? Didn't you just see him? Didn't he just appear to you two times? At least once for Thomas, but he's appeared two times to most of the disciples. And the reason they can't see him is because they've been out there all night. They're tired. They're hungry. They're disappointed. And as, they're on the, sh- as, the, as the sun is rising, they look out And there is a man on the shore. We don't know if there's others out there, but there's Jesus. They see him, but they don't recognize him. Secondly, they come to him because they hear him. Jesus wants to have a conversation with them. So obviously, while they're out there, Jesus is close enough for them to hear what he's about to say. And he says, have you caught anything? Do you have any food? 
What kind of a question is that? I mean, these are fishermen. What a disappointment to, to have somebody out on the shore asking you, have you caught anything? And then you say, we have nothing. And then Jesus gives them further instructions. He says, cast your net on the right side. So they see Jesus, they hear Jesus, but they don't yet recognize Jesus. And he says, cast your nets on the right side. This is an allusion to an experience that um, these disciples had before. If you go back to the Gospel of Luke chapter 5, at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, verses 4 to 6, Simon Peter has a similar experience. It says, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, this is the beginning of his ministry, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But when Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. What in a moment to recall your first encounter with Jesus. And once again, it's happening here. So they are motivated to come to Jesus on the shore because they see him, but they don't recognize him. They hear him. He gives them instructions and they catch all of this fish. So much fish, they, 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 they can't pull it in because it's so heavy, but the net doesn't break. And then Jesus gives them the ability to recognize him. And then one of the disciples, probably the Apostle John, who loves Jesus, that's how he describes himself, he says, it's Jesus. Very excited, that's Jesus. And guess what Peter does the moment he realizes who it is? They're only 100 yards from the shore, just a football field away. I mean, he, they are tired, they've been, they've been working all night, they haven't caught anything, and here in this moment... Peter says it's Jesus. He, jump, he puts on his, his outer cloak and he jumps in the water and he swims as fast as he can to get to Jesus. Can I share with you this morning the most significant moment of your life and mine is the moment we realize who Jesus really is. Is Jesus a man? Was he just an historical man who lived on the earth? Was he a, a good man? Was he a prophet? Or is he... Lord? Is he the Messiah who's come to take away the sins of the world and who's coming back again and who's going to rule and reign forevermore? The most significant moment of my life came when I was seven years old in vacation Bible school. I knew at that moment I needed Jesus. I knew at that moment that I was a sinner in need of salvation, and I thank God that he revealed himself to me, and I was able to come to him and receive salvation in his name. And the older I get, every year that I celebrate an Easter resurrection of Jesus, and every Sunday we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, I'm reminded of how much I need Jesus, and I'm reminded of how gracious and good Jesus truly is. He realizes in that moment it's Jesus. He jumps out of the boat and he comes to Jesus. And the rest of the disciples, they've got all this fish. They start heading to the shore. Verse 8, it tells us, But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about 200 cubits dragging the net with the fish. They've got so much fish. The message of the resurrection is an invitation not just to believe in Jesus and experience life in his name, but to come to Jesus. You and I are invited to come to Jesus. You and I are invited this morning, if you haven't, to make a decision to make Jesus your Savior and your Lord, to recognize your need for him. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If you haven't placed your trust in Jesus and have come, haven't come to that place of saying, I'm all in, Jesus. I'm going to follow you wherever you lead me. Whatever you tell me to do, I'm all in to be your disciple. That will be the most significant moment of your life. What you do with Jesus on this side of eternity will determine where you spend eternity. Will you receive him as Savior and Lord, or will you reject him and find the consequences accordingly? 
And so this morning, the message of the resurrection is a, is a message in which we are invited to, to believe in Jesus, experience life in his name, to come to Jesus, and then thirdly, to receive forgiveness from Jesus. As we said, these disciples have been through a lot. All the disciples in some capacity have abandoned Jesus. He's appeared to them already. Isn't it interesting if you take a look back at chapter 20 when Jesus first appears before his disciples in verse 19. Do you know what Jesus says to his disciples when he comes to them first? What do they need to hear? After all, they've abandoned him. Peter has denied him. One of them, Judas, has betrayed him. He commits suicide. He hangs himself. But you know what Jesus' first words to his disciples are? Peace be with you. What a powerful moment. Knowing that you may have abandoned Jesus, you may have denied Jesus. Thomas, even after Jesus rises from the dead and everyone tells him he's alive, some may have doubted Jesus. But what a wonderful message that the resurrection offers us, that it's a message of forgiveness. You know, you don't eat with your enemies, at least genuinely, authentically. <laughs> Jesus is about to not just have a meal with these disciples. Some who have abandoned him, denied him, doubted him. But he's going to make breakfast for them. Talk about breakfast with Jesus. Now this morning, Terry led our breakfast. Good, great breakfast. But can you imagine Jesus making you breakfast? And you spending time with him. What an incredible, powerful moment. Jesus, in this Narrative is revealing how he offers forgiveness to these disciples. In verse 9, we see the discovery of the disciples. Peter, he gets to the shore. The other disciples get to the shore. Verse 9, it tells us, Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. So there's a charcoal fire. There's a fire of coals. Do you know the last time Peter was around, at least in the gospel narratives, some coals of fire, a charcoal fire. You know, after Jesus had been arrested, Peter began to follow Jesus. As Peter followed Jesus, he began to warm himself on this charcoal fire. And as he was warming himself and following Jesus after he had been arrested, uh, a servant girl comes up to Peter and says, Hey, aren't you one of the disciples of Jesus? Aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter says, No. And then, if you recall, as he continues to warm himself, another person says, hey, no, you're with Jesus. I'm pretty sure that's you. I've seen you with him. Peter says, no. Then a third time, another person comes up to Peter as he warms himself on this charcoal fire, and he says, yeah, I'm pretty sure you're with him. And Peter says, no. In Luke chapter 22, verses 61 to 62, it says this. At that moment when Peter denied Jesus a third time, it said the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine the moment of denying Jesus, the one you said, I would never deny. If all these fall away, I will follow you. And in that moment, Peter locks eyes with Jesus. And then the rooster crows. He remembers what was said, and he begins to weep bitterly and now once again here is a charcoal fire and at this charcoal fire which is really an allusion to what has occurred previously this charcoal fire is a invitation to come and to eat breakfast with Jesus what a powerful moment you don't eat breakfast with your enemies these are disciples who have experienced Forgiveness, And we're going to see the full restoration take place where he doesn't just forgive them, but he commissions them as he's going to do Peter and change his weaknesses into his strengths. And so they get to see breakfast is being made by Jesus. He's already got fish there. He's already got bread there. And then the, as we continue uh, to read in verse 10, it says, Jesus said to them, bring some fish which you have just caught. You know, Peter, he's, he's a, a kind of guy who just, you know, does what he can. I mean, he's, he's quick. He'll do what he needs to do. And so he doesn't ask for any help with all the disciples. It tells us that he runs and, and goes get all the fish. There's 153 fish. There's a lot of them. It tells us the exact number. And he goes, grabs the nets, and he starts dragging it himself to bring it to Jesus, who's about 
to cook it. And it says in verse 11, there's 153, and although there were so many, the net was not broken. Verse 12, and Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. It's an invitation to come to fellowship, but also an invitation to receive forgiveness. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. The message of the resurrection is an invitation to receive forgiveness. I want to read to you Ephesians chapter 2 for just a moment that reminds us of this incredible gift. And you he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. Verse 4, but God. Aren't you thankful if you know Jesus as your Savior and Lord for that but God moment? But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sins. When he rose again in newness of life, that served as the receipt that, that, that his payment was received. And it indeed was something the Father found acceptable. You know, this past week, went out to buy some furniture. Um, I called up Pastor Kevin. He's got a truck and a big, big, big thing to pull it with. And so he showed up. With his, with his truck, and we went and we grabbed some furniture, and we went up to the place where we needed to pick up the furniture, and, and as we walked in, my wife reminded me in a text message, make sure you bring your receipt, because if you don't bring your receipt, they don't know if you paid for the furniture, and so sure enough, I showed up, and they didn't ask for the receipt right off the bat, they just popped the furniture in the back, and, and we were about to get going, but they said, where is your receipt, because we have to sign it. And the reason is because the receipt proves that it's been paid for. Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, and the resurrection is the receipt. It proves that it's been paid in full. Brothers and sisters, this morning, we are reminded that if you know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, the message of the resurrection is the invitation to be, and well, is an invitation to receive forgiveness of all sins, past, present, and future. And how many of you know, at least for us, when Jesus died on the cross and paid for our sins, they were all future. And so all our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven if we know him as our Savior and Lord. If you don't know him, the message of the resurrection is to come to him. All of us are in need of Christ and him crucified. We've all sinned. We've all missed the mark. We all find ourselves with something called sin that is a barrier between us and God. But what Jesus Christ did is he reconciled us when we were far from the Father and paid for our sins in full and was raised in newness of life, conquering sin, death, and Satan. The message of the resurrection is an invitation to believe in Jesus, to experience life in his name, to come to Jesus, to receive forgiveness from Jesus. And then lastly this morning, the message of the resurrection is an invitation for all of us, when you trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, to serve Jesus. As we finish up the text this morning, we get to read about in verses 15 to 17 how Jesus restores Peter. And when they had eaten breakfast... What a breakfast. Breakfast with Jesus. As Jesus makes fish and bread and presents it to them, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Now this would be, this is a powerful moment for Peter because three times Peter denied Jesus and now three times Jesus is going to ask him this question, do you love me? Peter is a guy who said, if all these fall away, Jesus, I love you even more than these. And once more, Jesus says, do you? You love me. And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And he says in verse 15, feed my lambs. 
Consider this, Jesus is going to ascend to the right hand of the Father. He's going to send the Holy Spirit, and he promises his disciples that he's going to come back again. The message of the resurrection is not just an invitation to come to Jesus and receive forgiveness of sins for our sins and receive salvation, but it's an invitation to serve him and to serve his people. The message of the resurrection is not just a message we receive and keep to ourselves. It's a message that we declare to the hopeless world around us who desperately need the light of Jesus Christ. Jesus is inviting Peter to serve him. Now, Peter, we, he's a weak guy. I mean, talk about a guy who always puts his foot in his mouth. I mean, he's always saying the wrong things at the wrong time. But as we open up the book of Acts, these men who are shaking in fear after the crucifixion and death of Jesus are the very ones boldly proclaiming before thousands and thousands the good news of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for sins and rose in newness of life. What changed? They received the power of the Holy Spirit to enable them to serve the Lord. It's not enough for us to receive salvation. We have been called to serve Jesus and to share this message and to serve his people. He asked the second time, he said to them, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Tend my sheep. And then a third time, he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Not only has Jesus forgiven Peter, not only has Jesus restored Peter, but he's now commissioned Peter to shepherd his people. How do you feed the people? How do you shepherd the flock by means of declaring the very word of the Lord? Every single one of us may not be called to be a pastor, to stand behind a pulpit, but each of us have been called to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to share the word of God with others. If you're a husband and a father, we have a unique calling to be the spiritual leaders of our home. And the good news and the message of the resurrection is that through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, God enables and empowers us to do that. If you're a mother or a wife, you have an opportunity with the word of God to encourage your husband and to instruct your children. If you find yourself in a place of employment, you have an opportunity to shine the light of Christ as you make re build relationships with others and introduce them to Jesus. The good news of the resurrection is not just that we have been forgiven and received salvation, but we have been commissioned through the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things Christ has taught us, knowing that he is with us even to the end of the age. And so the good news of the message of the resurrection is not just an invitation to believe not just an invitation to believe in Jesus and experience life in his name. It's not just an invitation to come to Jesus. It's not just an invitation to receive forgiveness. It's an invitation to as you receive forgiveness serve those around you by declaring the gospel that saved you and committing ourselves to serve him all the days of our lives into eternity. This morning, the invitation for all of us is to hear the message of the resurrection. It's a message of hope for the hopeless. It's that which brings joy out of sorrow. And so this morning, I want to invite you, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, I want to invite you in a moment like this to take a moment as you reflect on the truths of God's word from the, just between you and God to express your need for him. Say, Jesus, I need you. I'm lost without you. I know I've sinned, and the source of my sin is, is a rebellious heart, but I know that's why Jesus came. Believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was raised in newness of life, proving that his, the penalty he paid was sufficient, and then confessing him as your Savior and your Lord. This Resurrection Sunday, can we take time to pray and thank God? Father, we just want to thank you and praise you on this Resurrection Sunday, for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, for 
Uh, this incredible narrative as we got to dig into it today in John chapter 21. But Father, I pray, Lord, that in a moment like this, we would recall and remember why Jesus came, died on a cross, and rose in newness of life because of his love for us. Father, if there's here, someone here this morning who's never professed faith in Jesus as their Savior and their Lord, and has a desire by the stirring of the Spirit to do so, I pray that they can express this out loud or in their hearts, Father, I recognize I'm a sinner. I've missed the mark. I've fallen short of your standard. I know that the wages of sin is death and eternity without you and your people forever. I know that although the wages of sin is death, I know the gift of God is eternal life. I know Jesus came to die on the cross for my sins, to take my place and rose again three days later. Today I make Jesus my Savior. I make him my Lord, the one I will follow all the days of my life into eternity. Father, we rejoice that the one we pray to, the one we worship, the one we serve is not dead in the grave, but is risen. He reigns and he rules forevermore. Father, we thank you and praise you for these things and ask it in Jesus' name.